This was a series I finished watching a while ago, but I've kind of been holding off on making a reaction review just because I kind of wanted the impact of it to fade a bit. Because while this was an excellent series and is probably the best portrayal of mental illness I've ever seen, or one of the best at least, it hit very close to home and it was very difficult to watch. I had to finish the series in a couple different periods, like I had to take a week off in between some episodes, just because this is, like I said, extremely heavy. Uh, I'd almost say it kind of has a trigger warning because it, it is just very... Like I said, it just hits very close to home. So, Welcome to the NHK is a series about a number of different characters, four in particular, and their kind of struggles with mental illness and surviving in the postmodern world, particularly in postmodern Japan. Modern Japan is not very hospitable for young people these days. The there isn't that much work from my understanding. Prices are out of control and there's an increasingly aging population that the younger population is expected to pay for. There's also an issue of the economy having been stagnant. I forget if it's the 80s or 90s that's referred to as the lost decade, but Japan's post-war growth has dramatically slowed. And this combined with overpopulation, like I said, an aging population, falling birth rates, in a very difficult and intense culture has kind of led to a lost generation there. And what's kind of always interesting about things about the lost generation in Japan, which is to a certain extent what Evangelion's also about, is it's very similar to the lost generation in the Western world, only kind of magnified. Social isolation, a difficulty with work, trying to make have a, a reason for living and trying to have a worldview in a postmodern, post-religious world, these themes are all very present within Japanese animes or mangas that take place during this time period. And like I said, it's kind of a more extreme example of what is happening in the Western world. If anything, it's it's kind of a bit more distilled because you don't have a lot of the other things, uh, other factors that are hitting the Western world. Japan obviously doesn't have multiculturalism. It doesn't have mass immigration. It doesn't have the destruction of what is innately Japanese. So I, I think if you look at kind of the reflection of postmodernity within Japan, you kind of see it's, it goes beyond just diversity in society. It is kind of something fundamentally wrong with how the modern world is. But I digress. So Welcome to the NHK is about a series of characters, like I said, who are trying to struggle with kind of their mental illness, and they're all kind of in very bad situations in life. They all are exceedingly flawed and very realistic, like I said. They, they have kind of the combination of virtues and vices that you'd see in real people. So the title of the series, Welcome to the NHK, refers to the largest public broadcaster in Japan, the NHK, which from my understanding is kind of like the BBC or the CBC. And the NHK is, is used as kind of a shorthand and, and in general the concept of conspiracy in the series for the various characters being unwilling to accept any responsibility for their own failings. Like Hitomi Saito's senpai was the one who taught him about the whole conspiracy thing. She obviously suffers from borderline personality disorder and has issues with promiscuous sex, feelings of emptiness, drug addiction, and I don't think it's established, but she probably engages in self-harm and constantly thinks about suicide. So it's kind of a way to avoid accepting responsibility for her failings and the emptiness within her. She created this concept that there's a conspiracy going on that is is to blame for it. it it's kind of... It, it's crazy. It's. I'm trying to think of how to describe it. It's an exercise in, I guess, sealing off a part of yourself that you don't want to look at and giving a name to it and trying to pretend that it's separate. I guess it's kind of like creating your shadow. And the main character is Saito, and he is what's called a Hikikimori. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but I don't speak Japanese. So Hikikimoris are a phenomenon in Japan where it's, it's like being a neat, but it goes beyond that. So a neat is obviously not in 
not in education, employment, or training. And as someone who's basically come to terms with being unemployed and has kind of accepted that as being their current state of affairs. Now, there's, there's various definitions of NEAT. Some people would say if you're actively looking for work and you haven't found it yet, you're not a NEAT because you haven't accepted your current situation. And other people say it's, it's if you've accepted your situation and you're making no attempt to get out of it. Even if you're not formally employed, but you're doing contract work or whatever, or you run like your own business, that's not being a NEAT. A NEAT is kind of a specific cultural thing it kind of came out of the whole 4chan, um, the whole like drinking Mountain Dew, living in your parents' basement, that kind of thing. Having your parents pay for everything. And it's kind of a product of a lot of different societal factors. I like to point to the financial collapse or the financial crisis and the destruction of much of the what, what previously were entry-level positions. So it became increasingly difficult for normal people who don't have a like a very specific skill set to find any kind of long-term work. Also, some people would consider you a need if you work um, a part-time job that is below your capacity. Like maybe you have a bachelor's degree, but you work part-time, live in a tiny apartment, and just play video games all day when you're not working. So that could also be a need. However, most needs are also supported by their parents. But a hikikomori goes beyond that and it combines a extreme sense of social phobia, agoraphobia, etc. So the main character Saito is a hikikomori and he sleeps I think it's 18 hours a day and almost never leaves his apartment even to throw out garbage. So he lives in utter squalor and filth but he doesn't really care. And Welcome to the NHK is the NHK like I said is the largest public broadcaster in Japan. And Saito, to kind of justify the fact that he's going nowhere in life, decides that the NHK is broadcasting like a subliminal message that turns people into neats. So his inability to go to college, his inability to really do anything with his life, is a result of this external factor, and he refuses to accept responsibility for it. So then we enter kind of his foil, Yamaz Yamazaki, who was a kid that he knew back in high school, and Yamazaki is kind of the polar opposite of Saito. Well, Yamazaki is, is kind of a autist. He is an extremely hard worker. Uh, Yamazaki comes from a wealthy family of farmers, but he didn't want to be one. He wanted to go into game development. So he left his home, moved to Tokyo. He works like three or four part-time jobs while attending classes full-time to become a game developer. He's also an otaku. So while he's kind of... While he's kind of autistic in a lot of ways, he also is kind of a more sympathetic character because he wor he's willing to work very hard and to try to get out of his situation. And as the series goes on, he kind of becomes a bit disillusioned with his current lifestyle and comes to accept that maybe moving back home, uh, running the family farm, and marrying his waifu, like the, the girl they picked out for him, wouldn't be that bad. Japan is an exceedingly conservative society, and kind of the restoration of the status quo is the theme of a lot of animes. And it's often very jarring for Westerners, because Westerners, like I've said, have more of the infinity will. They have more kind of a desire for change and ascension. So the idea of like giving up magical powers or going back to your own world and leaving fantasy behind is, is kind of very hostile foreign to them it's just not a concept they would really pursue they would rather continue to be like a superhero or something whereas in japan normalcy and kind of a return to order is more their their societal focus so by the end of the series Yama, yamazaki just decides to go back run the family farm and get married and he's shown as being very happy with that and this kind of gets to a bit of a problem I have with the series is the various characters' problems get resolved. And while they kind of get resolved in mundane ways, I don't think they're really realistic. Like, Saito just kind of stops becoming a need at the end of the series and gets a job because he's going to starve otherwise. However, I don't know if that's realistic. I don't know if he would be able to pull himself out of the hole Kind of by that part in time, everyone's abandoned him. Yamazaki moved away. Misaki uh, Mis has left him. 
and he's all alone, but he's somehow kind of able to pull himself out of the hole. Also, Yamazaki, despite kind of his difficult situation, I don't think that many people can just move home and inherit the family farm and uh, become a wealthy farmer. So that's kind of the first two characters. I'm kind of going through it more character arcs than the actual plot, because this is 100% character driven. There, there isn't really an overarching story. That's a very common trait I find in postmodern stuff. And if I ever get my actual novel published, it's entirely, entirely character driven and not particularly plot driven. It's, it's the whole self-reflexivity thing. So then we have Misaki, who is a mysterious girl who has been spying on Saito for a long period of time. And she shows up and offers to treat him, <clears throat> to cure him of being a neat. So she, and by the way, well, obviously there's spoilers in this. So she obviously is not particularly well educated, but she digs up quotes from like Carl Jung and stuff in history, and she has nightly therapy sessions to try to get Saito out of his funk. And as we kind of go on, she initially appears to just be this this purely altruistic, kind-hearted girl. In fact, they he, Saito compares her to a hentai game protagonist who just shows up and helps him and loves him unconditionally for no reason. But as it goes on, we find out that she's completely messed up, probably more so in a lot of ways than Saito is, and that the reason she kind of undertakes this project in the begin from the first in the first place is to give her life meaning. At one point, she's called Saito lower than a dog, and as as kind of the the scum of society, and that by uplifting him, she's proving that she's better than him, and that she's not the lowest rung of society. So kind of with beneath her very kind exterior, there is kind of a lot of really kind of dark underlying. My understanding is she's a much worse person in the novels or the book. Sorry, the novels or the uh, uh, manga. But in the, the anime, I think they tried to make her a little more sympathetic. But I, I don't really like her. A lot of people like Misaki, but I find her to be manipulative <clears throat> kind of bitchy, um, controlling, and condescending. So she eventually becomes Saito's love interest, and they both kind of pull themselves out of the hole that they're in. She decides to finish her education, Saito gets a job, and they want to go to school together and kind of continue their life. Once again, could someone in Saito's position get who someone who is considered to be a fairly attractive girl? I rather doubt it. I, I don't think this situation is particularly normal. So to my mind, kind of my issue with a lot of this, like I said, is it presents mental illness and kind of the destitute situation of these characters in a very effective way. But the fact that they're able to kind of get out of their, their bad circumstances through deus ex machinas, to me, kind of undermines it a lot. Not only deus ex machinas, but kind of um, mundane ones. Like, an ongoing thing through the series is that Yazumaki and Saito are working on a hentai game that they hope to be big, and by the time they actually make it, it's crappy, it doesn't really sell any copies, and it's a disaster. I would have preferred, rather, to the kind of the mundane solution if their hentai game took off and they wound up making a ton of money, and that's kind of how they dug themselves out of the hole they're in. Now, I understand that that's not realistic, but to a certain extent, I think it would kind of blunt how kind of brutal and uncompromising the series is with looking at people's flaws and looking at kind of the issues of their generation. And that's kind of what makes this a brilliant series, but also an extremely difficult one to watch. Because you'll see yourself very strongly in these characters, and it kind of forces your nose into the kind of the muck of things that you're not happy with about yourself. It's, it's like I said, it's very difficult to watch. So kind of our final protagonist is Hitomi. So Hitomi is a Stacy. She's regarded as being exceedingly beautiful. And she does, she appears that way in the, the anime, but people around her consider her to be like absurdly hot. So Saito and her were in the literature club together, which consisted of her and Saito just reading magazines in a room for like the four years of high school now she very obviously is interested in Saito and wants to have a relationship with him but because he's he's so self-absorbed and he's so 
I guess you could say self-absorbed and has such little confidence he won't make a move on her. Eventually she makes a move on him and has sex with him as kind of a reward for keeping her company. And she kind of suggests they should continue a relationship, but Saito is just too much of a wuss to pursue it. And in contrast to his relationship with Misaki, I think a relationship between Hitomi and Saito would have worked out a lot better. Despite the fact that both of them are completely messed up, they have a very deep emotional understanding of one another. And they, they might be the only real people in the world who can truly kind of grasp each other and, and support each other in the way that they need. However, it doesn't really work out because of, well, mainly Saito, but also kind of Hitomi's own issues. And ultimately, yeah, Hitomi winds up marrying this, her boyfriend. But it's kind of interesting because it looked like Saito and her might get back together. But her boyfriend shows up and proposes marriage and she's just kind of starstruck and agrees to it. But given that their whole relationship is based on a sudden confession of love and marriage, it's probably not going to continue on for very long. There, there's no kind of no long-term basis to it. And she offers to have an affair with Saito before the end of the series. So it's, it's, I think it's very strongly implied it's not ultimately going to work out between her husband and her. Now, Hitomi very obviously has borderline personality disorder. And she's addicted to drugs, probably engages in self-harm, has promiscuous sex, etc. But I actually kind of find her the most sympathetic character in the series because she very obviously suffers from an empty self-image. She has a very diff uh, she she very obviously suffers from kind of depersonalization, a difficulty relating to other people and relating to herself, and kind of a very warped and negativistic worldview which really reminds me of myself in a lot of ways. So kind of of the four main characters, I sympathize, I kind of can relate to her the most, which is probably very unusual and not what they anticipated. So Welcome to the NHK, like I said, is an uncompromising look at modern millennial culture, at mental illness, and about kind of the horrors of post-modernity. And it forces you to look at yourself and look at the world around you. And it's, it's very unpleasant, even though it's often funny, even though it's very well done. I don't know if I can really recommend it. You just, if you're going to go into this, expect to have kind of a difficult time swallowing what it's trying to show you. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the reaction review. More to come, and I'll talk to you guys later.